Welcome everyone. It is wonderful to see you here today. I am super excited for our community of practice, our leadership community of practice today. It's great to see you. Bobby, it's good to see you. I feel like we were just in a meeting a few minutes ago, <laughs> but we were and it was a good meeting because we're looking at planning teacher prep across the state and how we're going to work across systems. And anyways, it's a good time in teacher prep. I know everybody's really exhausted at this point in the semester, um, but we are on final stretch. Just keep telling yourself final stretch, final stretch. It's almost time for a substantial break for all of us to almost like regenerate. You know what I mean? Like, it's like you get so depleted at this point. It's like you need a whole like influx of energy coming your way. So we are thrilled that everybody is with us today. My name is Renee Marshall and I work with the California Community College Teacher Preparation Programs, CCCTPP. I have been a proud member of the, of the collaborative team since 2007. Oh my goodness. Um, which is so, it's an honor to say, and we're thrilled to see you here today. I'm so excited for our speaker that we have today um, for many, many reasons. First off, the the idea of bringing together just leaders in our field to just talk to us in a casual way was something that I'm so glad we've been able to bring to fruition. So the first part of our session today, our speaker, it'll be a little more formalized. Then we're going to go into a little bit of an interview. We'll also have a chance for Q&A at any time that you have a question or you want to engage in dialogue. We invite you to um, go for it. Um, Oh, I'm so happy to see who's here. Cindy, glad to see that you're here right now in the chat. Um, one of our speaker's mentors is here right now, which is so wonderful to see um, and just an exciting moment. But let's get into the bio. So we know Renee, exactly. really quick, I have Absolutely. to throw out there. There is another of my previous mentors here, Patty Clarkson. Oh, awesome. Oh my gosh, what a small world. So no pressure here, but I have like, three of my favorite people here. So well, it's, it's lots really of people who exciting. believe in you when at the very beginning. And so it's so cool to see where you are right now. So cool. So let's okay, we have somebody else joining. Oh my gosh, and Kathy Squires, you guys, I know like half these people. Well, we're part of a family. You know, I love this so much. Strong, and that's, that's the truth, isn't it? So, okay, Jacqueline Vasquez has known since she was five years old that she wanted to be an educator. Ms. Vasquez has vivid memories of her earliest teacher giving a lesson on colors and immediately knowing that teaching was her destiny. Jackie currently serves as the director of early childhood education. Sorry, I'm admitting people as I'm reading. I apologize. Bobby, I might make you a uh, co-host too, so that way we can all do it. Um, Jackie currently serves as the Director of Early Childhood Education Programs for the Castaic Union School District. Her deep passion and commitment for the field of early childhood education has enhanced her leadership style by challenging education system norms and ensuring high quality education for the youngest and often underprivileged learners in her community. Ms. Vasquez is Guatemalan roots and her, and her journey as a first generation student in California's education systems has given her all the given her the drive to represent all families and all children and the desire to help develop and provide early childhood education programming that enriches culture, embodies inclusive practices and creates a sense of community for learners to thrive. Jacqueline Vasquez has her master's degree in early childhood education from Brandman University, a bachelor's degree in early childhood education from the University of Laverne, and she is a proud graduate of the California Community College System, where she received her associate's degree in early childhood education at College of the Canyons. Jackie also serves on the Castaic Union School District leadership team, and she is also on the board of directors for the Castaic Education Foundation. So with that, Jacqueline Vasquez, we are thrilled that you are with us today. Let's give her a round of applause to start off. And I still do claps, even though half of us are mute and whatnot. <laughs> So Jackie, I will mute now as you share with us a little bit about your journey and what it's been like for you. And then uh, we'll go into a bit of an interview in a few minutes after. Absolutely. I am so excited to be here. Um, and yes, I'm trying, I'm going to share my slideshow. Can everyone see this okay? Okay, perfect. So I am thrilled to be here. Um, I will share that this is the very first time that I present like this. So this is quite an experience for me, but just the same, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so thank you, Renee, for the amazing introduction. I am a um, supervisor administrator for the Castaic Union School District at the Early Childhood Education Programs. Um, and I also sit on the board of the Education Foundation, the directors, but my most favorite role is absolutely being a mom. 
that is my number one favorite role ever. And watching my son grow and going through all of these milestones that I've watched other children go through has been just amazing. So I will get started. So a little bit, uh oh, why isn't this going? Ah, why isn't this going, guys? Oh, here we go. So what we will, what I will be sharing with you guys today is my journey in leadership. What is leadership defined? And the philosophy for leading in a professional setting and personally, because I feel as a leader, we have to learn how to lead ourselves through various situations, through various phases in our life, seasons in our life, professionally and um, emotionally. And what does leadership look like in a school district? And how I empower others to lead. I think it's just delayed or not. Uh oh, here we go. So, according to Google, leadership is defined as the practical skill that encompasses each the ability of an individual group or organization to lead or to influence and guide other individuals, teams, or entire organizations. So when we look at it in print, you Google it, this comes up, this is the technical term, but I think leadership encompasses a lot more than that. Now, a little bit about my journey in order for you to be able to understand my perspective, my philosophy. That is me at the age of two and a half, almost three, in my hometown of Guatemala. So when I was about two years old, my grandmother started her journey to the United States. She did the crossing of the border, leaving me back home with my mother. My mother was a teen mom. So she was very inexperienced. She was going through a lot of emotions herself, being a young mom, being in a third world country, not having resources. So adding a child onto that and then, you know, all the other things, it made it very difficult for her to survive. And thinking about my journey and the time, I, I have some memories of this period of time being there and going through the traumas of, um, you know, watching the military right outside of our school, having to evacuate, having to leave, having to hide, having to wait for food, having to wait, you know, two days for the, the milkman to literally come around. So all of these things have been a part of the journey and who I am today. Um, two years after my grandma left Guatemala, she established a home in California, Santa Clarita, California, and then called for us. So at the age of four, um, we began our journey and I began my journey into coming and crossing the border over to California. We entered the United States in 1989. So I was, I had just turned, no, 88 because I was four. So 88, um, I, the journey was hot. It was long. It was exhausting. I remember every little bit of it. And as I grew up and knowing where I had come from, remembering my school back home and looking at the school systems here, looking at my peers in kindergarten, I immediately knew that I was different. I was different because I had different clothing. I had a different hairstyle. I didn't speak English. I communicated my needs very differently. And the kids obviously saw that and you know kids it was the teasing and laughing because I was different and I remember thinking in my first grade classroom I was sitting there not understanding anything that the teacher was saying to me I remember thinking to myself I need to learn I need to get past this I want to know what the teacher is saying during story time that was my most favorite time and the teacher was animated, but I did not understand what she was saying. I didn't laugh at the appropriate times that the other students did. Um, so it was in first grade that I actually learned to use a dictionary. And when I used that dictionary, I started translating my own spelling words and sentences to be able to understand what was being said. 
And then thank goodness for No Child Left Behind. There were a lot of interventions that were put in place. I started receiving some services. Um, the school system at that time tried to put me into a special ed setting because of my language barrier. So I, we fought that. And I, I say we, because I'm sure my grandma had a huge part of that, but I don't really remember, but I do remember being tested. I do remember my grandmother telling me that I was going to a special class. And when I walked into that class, it was, it was a shock because I didn't belong there. I wasn't learning. Instead, I shut down. So I quickly phased out of that and began to be, um, to attend back to a normal, a general ed setting. This thing does not like me, you guys. Here we go. So I did. I missed home. Um, my family, was, the rest of my family was left behind. My cousins were left behind. And um, I think I shared part of this already. I learned how to look up these words and started to understand the dialogue, conversations. I started to make friends. And so school became a happy place for me. I always loved learning, learning, listening. It was always a such a fun thing for me. Like Renee shared at such a young age, I knew that I wanted to be in teaching because I love learning. I loved everything about it. Um, so in this picture here, you see that is me and my cousin. And the girl in the back there is the girl that used to help us and take us to and from school and everything. And I still remember her and it's one of my fondest memories. So as I moved through the school system by seventh grade, um, I began to finally think and process thought and respond in English. Now being an English language learner, um, for those of you that are English language learners, we know that when we hear something, when we read something, when we see something, we think about it and sometimes in a different language, depending on what it is that you're reading. I used to read things in English. I used to hear people talking to me in English, but my thoughts were always in Spanish. What am I going to respond? So I had that delayed response. Up until seventh grade, that was my reality. It would take me a little bit to respond because I was mentally translating my responses to English from Spanish. Um, so once I was able to do that, it was like a whole new world open. And I realized this when I was in math class, actually, because I realized that the equations I needed to understand. And when you translate equations into Spanish, it's very different. Math is very different. So that's when I finally realized I got this. I've got it down. All through um, through high school, about my sophomore year in high school, my grandmother passed away. Um, she was everything to me. She was like my mother. So that was a really, really rough time. Um, I separated from my biological family and I was informally adopted by another family, took me in and kind of put my pieces back together. But that wasn't until I was, I think, a junior by then. But when my grandma passed, I knew that I needed to do something for myself because I no longer had a person to look out for me. So what was I going to do? How was I going to lead myself through a path that was going to get me to my end goal was to be in teaching? So I started taking classes in high school um, through the ROP program. Now, Renee, I don't remember what that stands for. Regional Occupation Program. <laughs> Got it. So I- was around so long, we remember like all the, yes. uh, it's the yes. old PTE. <laughs> yes, so I went through that program. I worked at a preschool for a couple years, which is actually where I met my adoptive family. And that is how I got into this whole field. I began working as just, I was just doing hours there and I loved it. The director got to know me. She was really happy with my work. I bonded with families to this day. I actually just a, a week over this past weekend, um, I saw one of the families that was in that first class and that child is 22 years old. So that was a little shocking how long I've been in this field. Um, so that is how I got started in my journey. Um, shortly after that, I got into the district um, system at the Saugus Union School District as at that time an activity leader. So it was like a after school counselor for the after school program. 
I quickly moved up to assistant site supervisor and then gradually moved up about two years later to a site supervisor where I oversaw um, tuition-based programs and state-funded programs. So that is the state preschool programs. And then we also had a, a state-funded after-school program, which was the ACES program. Um, I was there for about nine years. I served at Cedar Creek Elementary, which is a Title I school. Um, so they have a high rate of English language learners as well as um, free and reduced lunch. That is how they determine the eligibility and our state preschool program. And about the last year I was with Saugus, I served at an, another school, much smaller program. And then I was really um, given the opportunity to move up to Castaic. And that is where I am today. So as you can imagine, my journey has really taken, it has taken me as a leader of my own destiny at a very young age to make pretty much adult choices for myself and not realizing how hard it could have been. But I had amazing mentors throughout that whole process, many which are sitting here today. Kathy, you're one of my latest, hello. So that brings me to my philosophy. And as a leader, um, I would say that overall, I see leadership as a collective opportunity. Um, it's really important for me to focus on my individual team and be able to give them the ability to lead the our team, our teaching, our entire teaching team, but also lead their classrooms, empower them by using their specific strengths. And by that, I mean, for example, I have one staff member who is amazing with technology. I received a bunch of CDs and I don't even know how to upload those onto the Google Drive. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I call her, I emailed her, Rosemary. Oh, you know, Rosemary, can you please upload these? Absolutely. She was so pumped to be able to provide that resource to her colleagues. I have another colleague, another team member as well, colleague, that is very resourceful and very social out in the community. So anytime there's an event, there's a food drive, there's a fair or anything, she provides those things. So I really feel as though leadership has to be a collective and democratic because it really allows everyone as part of the team to be such an intricate and important part of the big picture. Um, so this follows, and I'll read just a little bit here. So this does follow the John Dewey. Thumbs up if you remember John Dewey. Patty, this one's for you right here. Um, belief in educational leadership and involves participation of all stakeholders, including children. And that is, I think, as leaders, a part that we sometimes forget, empowering our littles in the classrooms to teach them and empower them to be their own leaders and to lead their peers and to show them their own strengths in the classroom. So I really feel as though the, co the collective leadership really encompasses many of those um, parts and components in what it takes to, to lead an, an organization. And it's also, it, it's amazing for individual development, the sense of accomplishment and the sense of just positivity that we get as individuals, as people, as teachers, as women, as, you know, as students to be a part of something big and contribute. And then the amazing transformation that I have seen with my team alone, I have been so lucky and so blessed to have the same team for the past three and a half, four years. Um, so we've had some new members due to growth, but we have had pretty much the same team. Um, so we've been able to build on, on a lot of these things. And during our crisis teaching, we got so much closer and this collective leadership became such a tool for us because we can, we could, I didn't even have to lead the meeting. Sometimes I was in webinars because we know during that time it was webinar at this time, webinar at that time, I was able to say, okay, ladies, this is what we need to do. And they just knew the roles. They knew what had to be done. And we just did it. And then we came back and we put it to put those pieces together. And that is, that was my vision for leadership. 
Um, I also want to add, though, that leadership can look very, very different dependent on your team. So it is crucial to get to know your team as individuals. In my case, I don't I only have one male, our um, preschool psychologist working, but he we got I got to know them individually. I got to know them as women as mothers, as educators, as any role that they have, because all of those pieces make up who they are. And that gave me insight on getting to know how to talk to them, how to approach them, how to delegate things, how to ask them for things, and when maybe they needed a little bit more from me, having that insight on their life as humans, not just educators. Um, so those things can look very different. And I think that's something too that um, part of being a leader is understanding that, that your leadership um, can change. And as our teams change, then our leadership styles will change as well. Because now we are not in the same place. My team and I are not in the same place that we were in even six months ago. So we change and we change together. But the amazing thing is that we have this bond because we know each other, we trust each other, we have a sense of community. Um, so we evolve together and we grow together. Jackie, you're saying all sorts of stuff that I'm like writing notes on, like how about a shirt that says we evolve together? Like, I know I've been on my shirt kick lately, but I you, love that. And I love that you're talking about the roles within your team, because I think a lot of time people don't do stuff when they don't know what they should be doing. And so knowing your people, I mean, just wonderful, wonderful what you're saying. I awesome. I love that. Um, so empowering others. That is huge for me. Um, and I kind of, and I talked about that, empowering others to be able to use their strengths in our team. Um, one thing that I'm working with my team members at this point is to kind of take that lead when it comes to parent education. So at a district level, and let me see if I have so at the district level, it is um, it is very different than a tuition based program or the private sector um, and even Head Start. There are different regulations. There is a hierarchy of roles. You know, we have the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, and then there's myself, the teachers, the instructional assistants and every and the students. Um, so. It's important that the teachers understand as well that it's not just up to me to educate families and to educate the children. They also have a huge role. And then I also really want to empower each family member to understand that they are the most important piece of the leadership in education for their child. Oftentimes, and it's very cultural, it could be very cultural, where families look at us educators and they hold us up on this pedestal and you do the teaching and I do everything else and only you teach. But when I sit down and I have that conversation with parents or we have that first um, parent meeting or orientation, that is one of my first things I tell them. You are your child's first teacher. You taught them to sleep. You taught them to eat. You taught them to love. You taught them to express their needs. And now it is up to us to teach them those things in social settings and in academic settings. So it's empowering not just our teachers and our children, but also our families and our communities to be a huge part of this learning, um, it, the schools of for the kids that are in our programs. And I think at the school district level, it is a little bit different because we have this different ladder of hierarchy and roles and um, it, it could be a little bit blurred sometimes and sometimes it can be tricky, but I think the most important part is just, it's getting to know your team, getting to know their individual strengths what can they bring to the table? Are they comfortable sharing those things? And if they're not, how can we help them build that capacity? How can we empower them and teach them and show them that they can do this? Um, so, you know, during, I'll share a quick little story. During our crisis teaching, actually, I think I was in Patty's class when we were in the middle of creating this um, online virtual tool or learning platform for our preschool students and our special education students. 
Now, when we look at teaching um, and we look at all of our staff, there are many different generations. And that is a huge barrier. And as a leader, I had to take a step back and I had to stop and ask myself, okay, I know how to use the computer. I know how to use Zoom. I know how to use Google Classroom. I know how to use the drive. I'm going to expect my staff to do this. And I'm going to expect my parents to do this for their children. But do they know how to do this? Are they comfortable? Because if they're not, they're cortisol level is going to go through the roof. They're not going to be in an executive state of mind to be able to do these things. So it was a really, really big learning curve for my staff that had no technology experience at all. And when I tell you no technology experience, I mean zero technology experience. Um, I had to drive to people's houses and with gloves and masks and six feet apart, I'm showing them how to log on, do this, do that. I drove to at least three different homes to teach my staff how to do this, but I needed to do that. And I needed them to see that I was willing to teach them um, what I expected them to learn, just like we do in the classrooms. And that's how we got through it. So I had many staff that shared and said, I can't do this. <clears throat> it's too hard. I don't know technology. And so I had to have them take a step back and stop and think, okay, I can do this. I will learn to do this because I have help to do this. <clears throat> so it was important for me to help them understand because now they were my students, um, helping them understand that they could accomplish this. And now those same teachers that were telling me, I can't do this, I can't, I can't, I can't. Those are the teachers that are leading our small groups and using the smart board or that are or opening up Zoom meetings for me when I'm running late. Um, so watching that, watching them evolve from I can't and I don't to I have and I am has just been phenomenal. And I am so unbelievably proud of them for getting there. Um, but that is all a part of, again, our team and how we have evolved together. Um, another part of what I think leading, not just in the school district, but I think anywhere is setting the example, working with them. They don't work for me, we work together. If there is a toilet overflowing and I am stepping in to be an aide because the aide is out, and she would have taken care of that, guess who's going to take care of that? Me. So just because I'm the program director and I'm stepping in, that doesn't mean I'm going to take that role away from the teacher because of my title. No, they are the leader in the classroom. And I tell them, you tell me what to do. Tell me if I need to do anything else. Um, and setting that example to work alongside of them and teach them and show them that I'm willing to do anything and everything that they are. My favorite part of this being a leader, I think, in any aspect is getting out in the community, using community resources and building those relationships. I truly take pride in doing that and building that in our community. Um, when I came to Castake, obviously no one knew who I was. Um, leaving Saugus after being there for almost nine years, people would just say it was word of mouth. Go see Miss Jackie at Cedar Creek or go see Miss Jackie at Rio Vista. I came to Castaic and nobody knew who I was. And it was it was a hard transition. So I needed to get out there. I needed to start building relationships. When our um, Val, Val Verde is kind of, um, it's a little community up a mountain. It's kind of secluded. Um, they had taco nights every Thursday and Friday nights over the summer. Guess where I was Thursday and Friday nights building relationships, buying tacos and getting to know the community. What, did, what were they, their needs? What were their events? What could we use each other for? How could we build a community together? Now I get text messages. Hey, we're having burritos. Come by. And um, during the pandemic, we had actually our biggest in the Valley, our biggest distribution of meals was in the Valverde community. Um, I had deputies up there helping me. I had um, the park 
and recreational leaders helping. Um, our superintendent was out there delivering meals every day. So it's using those things around you to really build your community and have those resources at your fingertips for your families. And likewise, I had, you know, our park um, recreational leader call me, my granddaughter's turning four, I need her in preschool. Perfect, this is what you do. And now he has that information and can pass it along to other people. So that is how um, building connections and building the relationships, getting to know what we can, what we have to offer to each other um, is a very intricate part of being successful. I love that you shared that, Jackie, because you're all over in our community. And I don't, I don't mean that as a negative. It's I know it's a negative for you sometimes because it's probably depleting and exhausting, but I also know that you value it so much that you constantly walk your talk, you know? So when you're saying community building, like if there's a huge event happening in that, especially in the Castaic sub community of Santa Clarita, I know you're going to be there. And I think that's why we see each other so frequently, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yes. And so that was the end of my slideshow, you guys. We had other questions in mind, but I do really want to emphasize that being in the community is so important. And during the pandemic, that was so evident. So if there is anything that you take away today is get to know who is there, who is in your community, um, what do you have to offer to the community and build those relationships there. Um, because it's it's so important. And it was such a huge help for our families during the pandemic that I am so glad that I was there within enough time to have that relationship established to get those resources for our families in need. I love that, Jackie. One of the other things that you said before we go on to some more questions here is knowing the roles that each of the people that you work with play and not like the roles in this, I mean, I know you need to know their roles within the work structure, but you're also talking about how you know, like I need to know if they're a parent, I need to know if they're in school right now, I need to know if they're working three jobs, like you need to know these pieces. And I really appreciate you saying that because how you relate to people depends on the roles they play. And the fact that you pick that up and, and you like can help to identify, it's like you become an insider with the person for the moment, even if you're an outsider. So the strategy on that is really, really brilliant. And I know it's just natural to who you are, but there's a deep strategy within that as well, you know? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's also what brings us closer together. And I mean, even during the pandemic, I, I mean, I, I'm sure you guys all experienced the same, the stress and the feeling isolated. And sometimes, you know, the staff would come to me when they're feeling overwhelmed and they, it was just a vent session. And there were other times when I would go to them and I would say, you know, I'm feeling really overwhelmed by this can you please help? And then it would turn into a venting session. So we really, they have seen me in vulnerable positions. And that's important too, because they also need to understand that I too am a mom, a, a single mom. So sometimes if I don't respond to their text message at the drop of a dime, I'm sorry, I was doing homework with my child. Okay, cool, I understand. So getting to know those things, not just about them, but for them to know those things about me as well. Just humanize me. I'm not a machine. I, and sometimes they tell me that you're just a machine. You go, go, go. And no, I'm not just a machine. Sometimes I malfunction too. So it's, it's important too, that they, they know the human side of me as well. I love that you just said humanize me. I'm not a machine. It's, and we're spending so a lot true. of time looking at this concept of, you know, last year we were looking at how do we humanize the virtual space? And now we're talking about how do we humanize education no matter what space you are in? And I love that you mentioned also creating that space for venting and how it was a reciprocal both sides. Because I think there needs to be safe spaces within the professional context where you can have these conversations, especially post pandemic, um, and not feel threatened to have those conversations. But like you said, establishing the relationships, really, that's the way to have those conversations. Now, Jackie, I'm wondering, as a leader, what's one of your biggest challenges? I think um, an overall challenge is sometimes the differences in cultures. Um, we see that with the families that we serve and we see that with the staff on our team as well. And sometimes it's, um, I'll give an example. We had a student that was, um, that had just moved from China. 
Now in China, it is very common. It is actually expected that their shoes are removed before they enter home. When this child started, we knew that she did not speak any English. We knew that she was going to need a lot of help, a lot of guidance, a lot of patience. Um, what they did not know is those cultural differences, like taking off her shoes. So I would have the teacher texting me, she's taking her shoes off again. And so then I, I stopped on day three, it took me three days. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is cultural. Let's talk to mom. Let's talk to the families. Let's get our interpreter in here. Let's figure out how we can communicate with the families that this is cultural. So after about a month, um, the little girl started noticing that everyone kept their shoes on. But for that period of time, we let her because that was her comfort. That is what she knew. That is what she needed to feel safe in her learning environment. So I think sometimes that is one of the biggest things that can be um, challenging is helping the others on my team understand that there are a lot of these differences and trying to help them navigate the challenges of those differences. Well, now so-and-so wants to take their shoes off. So let's use that as a, as a learning experience for that child. You know what? She came from a different country. Let's look on the map where that came from. And on that map, look, she came, this is China. It starts with the letter C, it's a capital C. And we talk about that. It's such a learning experience for children about diversity, acceptance, differences. Um, and sometimes in these teaching moments and in the chaos of getting kids through the door and getting their hands washed, staff get caught up in that. So I think that's sometimes one of the biggest challenges is um, having others understand the differences in cultures and um, routines that kids have at home and what we expect them to do in the classroom. I love that. Kim just said on the on the chat here, inside and outside shoes, we wear slippers. And so I love I love this. That's so great. And I always it's always make sure not you because you're speaking, but everybody else. I hope you're watching the chat because we have a, a group that is uh, talkative, which is so wonderful. I love that. I, I love it, too, Jackie. As a beginning teacher, one of my biggest regrets was a, cu a cultural mismatch I had with a student. And it literally took me like a couple years. And all of a sudden I had an aha moment where I was like, oh, why did I present myself that way? culturally it and you know and so it's nice to have um that knowledge base early so now jackie i'm curious and like you're literally coming to us from orlando florida today um correct and yeah. so um i'm gonna i hope i don't mind you don't mind that i'm like kind of egging on with this one here but what leadership yeah. trainings or organizations do you suggest for education leaders so i i will share i am in orlando florida and I am ecstatic to be here. Um, years ago, and I believe it was actually in Cindy's class that I got a book. Oh, I think I left it back there. Oh no, it's on. It's under my laptop. I don't know if you remember this, Cindy. So conscious discipline. I became familiar to conscious discipline many moons ago in Cindy's class. And that is a framework. It is not even a curriculum. It's a framework. It's a mindset um, uh, for social emotional learning. Now I can talk about it for days, but I have been using and implementing on and off in my life that um, the framework of conscious discipline. Now being in leadership, I highly recommend this for you as a person, because unless we become conscious adults and we become responsible for our actions, our responses and our emotions and our own self-regulation, we cannot teach that to others. So if there is anything that you guys um, can learn is conscious discipline in the framework. How can we do that? And the reason why I love this so much, it's because it's not just do this and do some breathing and do some yoga and do some coloring and take a walk and you'll be fine. No, this is brain-based research, Dr. Becky Bailey. And you guys, she's sitting next to me at the conference. I was like, oh my gosh. So I'll be getting a selfie with her later and I can't even stand myself, but um, it's learning how to do those things for yourself 
and learning how to, um, she is such a rock star, Cindy. It, she's phenomenal and she's funny too. Um, I lost my train of thought, but that I, is- I have to say you too, you dropped your fruit and she also shared her food with you. Yes, I totally spilled my fruit this morning. They took breakfast away and she's like, oh, don't worry, just eat some of mine. Put it on a napkin and eat some of mine. I'm like, oh my gosh, my heart. I can't even stand myself. I love her. Um, so that this has really helped me as a, as a person. It's helped me as a parent and it's helped me as a leader. Um, and what I was saying is that it's brain-based, it's research, it's been proven that this works because it's using your brain and how your brain functions to be able to um, make this framework happen. Did, did, so you it, which, did you say which conference you're at? I don't know if I heard what conference you're at. It is the Conscious Discipline. Oh, um, it okay. It is. Yeah. So it's oh. a conscious discipline, but the one I'm at specifically is for students with autism. So how do we implement this with students with autism? So like I said, I could talk about this forever um, and I can come back. I'm more than happy to come back or if you want to reach out to me, I'll put my email in the chat and I can totally reach out to you. We can zoom in. I can give you some um, things about um, conscious discipline and what has helped me personally. Um, another thing, another resource as a leader, just to get some um, tech, some assistance with an, the overall component of um, early childhood education specifically is CPIN. Now, Kathy Squires is here from CPIN, and it's the California in Preschool Instructional Network. They have been such an imperative part of our growth, and with Kathy's um trainings online. We learn technology together, right, Kathy? Um, and such an amazing network. It's through LACO and their trainings. They've got stuff online. Um, SECO, there's also SECO online. So there are a bunch of different things. If you are a state-funded program, Every Child California, and I can put these um, websites in once we have some questions time too. If you just go to, if you just Google Every Child California, that is the organization at the state level. They are the ones that send out all of the legislation, all of the updates about anything and everything related to preschool and early care. Um, and they're even starting to send out a lot of information for the new up and coming transitional kindergarten. We've all been talking about that. I was just on a meeting right before this about yeah strategy with what's happening and funding and all that. So uh, it's an exciting time in early childhood. Now, Jackie, we're curious, and this is, I think this next question is gonna be a little difficult because okay. I wanna know about who your mentor is. And so I'm not sure who you're gonna pick. You've got a lot of really good mentors, I know that. Um, and so tell us a little bit about somebody or one or two people who you consider your mentors. And then I think something that's really important, as leaders, we still need mentors. I think sometimes we get in a position, like you're in charge of all the ECE for that whole district. So people would assume, well, that's it. That's J Jackie's it. That's the mentor we go to. So then who do you go to when you need the mentor? And so tell us a little bit about not just who your mentors are right now, but how have you found mentors along your journey? So that is an excellent question. And it is a difficult question because I really feel for me personally, um, mentors in different parts of my life. So when I started out in my journey in at Saugus, when I became a site supervisor, my mentor at that time was my boss. And she was my mentor because she wasn't just teaching me the ins and outs of operations, but she was also challenging me and pushing me and constantly giving me that extra little bit to push myself to show me that, yes, you can do that too. So she taught me how to be a mentor through her actions. Um, prior to that, I really, and I'm not just saying this because you guys are on here, but I would say Cindy, Renee, and even Wendy Ruiz at College of the Canyons, you guys have been my mentors. I have looked up to you since I was in high school taking courses. So having that, this, opportunity to be here with you guys is amazing. It's just amazing. Um, currently right now, I think that I go to different people for different things. 
my, I would consider one of my mentors, um, our CBO, believe it or not. She is our chief business officer, Lynette Hodson. Um, however, she is so just well composed. She's very matter of fact. She's very um, diplomatic, but she's also very resourceful. And she has that capacity to go to take me from my emotional state when that fight, fight or flight and I'm fighting, fighting, fighting or flying, flying, flying. Um, she has the capacity to really bring me back and say, OK, let's take a deep breath and let's look at this. And then, you know, then I can come back to my executive um, state of mind and solve the problem. Um, personally, I think that I sometimes go to different people depending on what it is. When it's something about um, my son or being a mom, I go to a friend, a very, very close friend who has gone through all of these things with her sons and her boys. So I think it is, Renee, you mentioned that it's important for us as leaders to have mentors as well. We fill cups constantly. Every day we're filling cups in one way or another. So we need to have a way to fill our cups too. And coming to these things like conferences with Dr. Becky Bailey, who is the ultimate cupper filler, is I would say that that is one thing that I look to too. I, I need to be, we need to be aware of what our needs are to be able to get those resources to, to help us. I love that. I see Cindy's hands up. So Cindy, would you like to share? Thank you, Renee. I, my cup is overflowing right now, Jackie. And I just want you to know that I look up to you and I am so grateful mm -hmm. to have you in our field, in our community. I know so much of the good work that you were doing and being here, I, I, I had to be here. I had to, I actually had open office hours today and they're on, on my phone because I wanted to hear you. Thank goodness nobody came on. And I am just so grateful, Jackie, to see all your growth because I've known you for so long. And oh, I love your lead. I love your ideas about leadership and how you carry those out. So just thank you for being such a wonderful professional. And you and I need to talk because we need you. We need Absolutely. you in our, in our department. I would love that more than anything. And thank you for those words because you have no idea how much it means to me. It really, really does. I love that you said that, Cindy. I've been telling Jackie for a while, it's time for you to become faculty now. I, I think I'm getting ready, you guys. I'm getting ready. So yes, Cindy, we'll, I'll reach out and we'll chat. <laughs> love it. Um, Jackie, I have another question for you too. Mm -hmm. And this kind of goes to what we're saying now, really, you know, in the position you're in at this point, how are you able to mentor others? And what does that look like for you? And, um, you know, we know that you value mentorship. So tell us a little bit more, like, how do you balance that leading a district, you know, leading the ECE part portion on multiple school sites? How do you still mentor the next generation? Um, I think it, a part of that is being out in the community. Um, being aware of where you can be of service and of help, who needs your mentorship, and what are their needs. Um, I am very fortunate to be a part of the, and I don't remember again the acronym, what it stands for, the CPTP program um, with Renee. And that is a program where I am able to mentor other students in the field or who are kind of playing with the thought of going into the teaching field um, or more specifically the early childhood education field. Um, and it's just as easy as working with my team at my school sites, getting to know my mentees, getting to know them as individuals, as students, what are their needs? Um, what classes are they taking? What are they interested in? Um, in this past semester, one of my strategies um, was to collect syllabuses. I wanted to see what the syllabus was. What are the expectations of that professor? for my students, what are they going to need? And how can I support that and enrich their learning through their syllabus? So um, what I did was I created a slideshow on Google Drive. I shared that with them. And each time we met each week, uh, based off of their syllabus, I created a slide in just providing resources about that. 
Um, so for example, I had one student who was, they were talking about um, the preschool learning foundations. So I was able to upload all of the different preschool learning foundations volumes, where she could get additional training um, and how, and then we had discussions about that. So again, I think it really goes back to getting to know who needs support, how do they need support and what can I do to provide that support? It's interesting, Jackie, because it goes along to a comment we got in chat from uh, Kim Barker, um, Kim's faculty over at Antelope Valley College in uh, early childhood child development. And she put, sometimes mentors are spaces we enter, intentionally sitting back, listening, learning, processing, choosing to embrace all that we hear, spaces where your contribution is your willingness to truly listen. Incredible lessons. Isn't that interesting what she wrote? Yeah, and it's so true. So eloquently phrased, um, but it is, it is so true. Love it. Okay, let's look now. We have a question here that I have one more question, then we'll open it up to see anybody who is on right now who might have questions for you. Um, Jackie, I'm wondering, you know, the last, I was going to say a few months, but the last year and a half, we've been in totally uncharted territory. Um, so we want to know about how do we keep the passion and the fire alive for leaders during incredibly uncertain times? That I think was one of the hardest things. And that is the one thing that I learned along the way. Um, there has been nothing, nothing, nothing that we have experienced as educators um, like we've experienced in the past year and a half. And I think one thing that kept that fire going and kept that momentum going with my team is having that downtime, having the Zoom meetings where we could just talk. Um, what did you do this morning? What did you do to teach to help yourself? What did you do to take care of yourself? And that was one thing that I really tried to instill in my staff is that at home, they were parents, they were wives, they were mothers, they were um, neighbors, they were caretakers, they were teachers. They had all these different hats on, but what were they doing for them? Because we had all these other people doing so many, expecting so many things from them. You know, I expected them to run a preschool classroom virtually. Their children expected them to feed them, clothe them, bathe them, all of these things. So I, it was, I think it's really taking the time to teach those that are around us how to take care of themselves. And the way that I really attacked that was through using conscious discipline. We would use a lot of the practices. Um, we, use, we use them now. I use them in my own personal life. In the airplane, I was panicking because two people behind me are coughing like crazy. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> breathe. So, you know, teaching my staff how to know their triggers and know how to manage them and what to do to help them and bring them back. Um, we did a lot of different things. There's um, a connection calendar um, in conscious discipline. It's just a simple little 30 day thing of things that you can do for others and things that you can do for yourself. Because as um, educators, we know that doing things for others fills our cup as well. Um, but I also needed them to do something for themselves. Um, and then just, I, I try to do little things when I do school site visits, I leave them a little note today. I noticed that you did this. That was really, really great. I saw that this child asked you this and your response was this. And now look at what has happened. Um, you know, every payday, I make it a, a goal to send a $5 gift card to at least two staff members. So something so minimal, but it makes their day. Saturday morning, I'll send it off, you know, via text, take a, take a nice walk, take a deep breath and have a cup of coffee on me. Thank you for doing this this week, acknowledging them um, and not acknowledging just who they are, but what they do and what they bring to our team um, and the empowerment and all of those things. And I think all of those tiny little things really add up to be big things. And um, even though we all felt stressed, we all felt exhausted, we were there to support each other and to help each other. And they helped me remember to take care of myself too. So again, it's that reciprocal relationship and helping each other um, take care of each other. I love it. Crystal put, I would run to work with your team. 
Well, I think we're all looking for a nurturing environment. You know what I mean? And, and we all hope for that. So wonderful. Let's open it up to some questions from those that are on right now. Would anybody like to either ask a question in the chat or unmute? That would be great. I'll wait in silence for a minute, see who unmutes or uh, ask a question. I have a question, Renee, if you wouldn't mind. Wonderful, Kim, thank you. Yes, Jackie, thank you so much for the insight and just sharing so much of yourself. It's just a beautiful thing to witness and so appreciated. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, giving so much of ourselves in education and making sure that we're supporting each other can really be taxing at times. And so I was wondering if you might be able to share with us some of the, the techniques that you use in your life to make sure that you are taking care of you mm -hmm. and, um, and how do you model that for your, your um, team? You gave some examples of you know, uh, writing notes for them. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm speaking more in just the mindful help and mental help that we all need to, to give ourselves. Can you share some of that with us? Absolutely. I would love to. Um, so I have mentioned conscious discipline a lot. That is something that I really truly live by day by day. Um, it is, like I explained, a framework, a mindset, an understanding of your emotions and how to deal with them. So I know and I have learned that watching other people's emotions is a really big trigger for me. So if I have a staff member that is actively upset and crying, it's really hard for me to find a solution immediately because I just, I want to fix it and I want them to stop crying and I want them to feel better. So I take a step back. And in life, that's what I do too. When there, there's a lot going on, I slow down. Sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. So whether it's in the middle of the day, it's really stressful. I'll take a few minutes, go downstairs and walk around the parking lot a few times, you know, take those deep belly breaths to make sure that I can come back to my executive state again. Um, I love to read. That is a huge escape for me. Um, I love to read anything from romance novels to self-help books to Harry Potter, um, to yes, conscious discipline. I have my books here with me today. Um, with my staff, um, a, a lot of them, I mean, educators, most of them like to read and like to, you know, learn more things. So we actually had a book study. We picked a book and we had a book study. Um, so we each, every month we would read a chapter and we're actually gonna do this with the new um, conscious discipline book that was just released. Um, read a chapter and then we meet whoever wants to join. I set up the meeting, I put the meeting, um, the virtual meeting information up and we come together, we talk about it. How does that, what does that look like in our daily life? What can we do to help that? Um, what does that look like in the classroom? How does that look like in society? Because we know we have a lot of society stressors now too. Um, so I really try to, implement some of those things with them so that they see as well. Um, I also love to get massages, you guys. It is the best thing ever. I go to the chiropractor and I get a massage at least every eight weeks because it is just amazing. That is my quiet time and it feels good. So, and I share that with my staff, you know, do something for you because your mental health is vital. If you don't have, if your mind is not, if you've got cortisol, you know, we have the dopamine, which is the feel good. And then we have the cortisol, which is the downer, the, the stress. If we don't have enough of that dopamine and enough of that feel good, you can't function. Your brain physically cannot function and proceed to learn or to teach or do anything. Thank you so much. Of course. I appreciate everything that you just said there, because it's just, I think about recently, my family had a, a very, uh, you know, my mom's been very sick and mm -hmm. uh, Thanksgiving was incredibly stressful. It wasn't a time where my family could come together at all. Mm -hmm. And so I said, literally said to my husband, we need to make a plan for Christmas because I'm like, I can't handle that again. And so I really appreciate you like, you know, giving this heads up of like really needing to know ourselves and what we need because we're constantly always helping others. I literally said to my husband, just so you know, I need to travel soon. 
And he's like, what do you mean? I said, I'm not talking international. I just need to do something soon. It could be we go to the casino for a day, but I got to do something like that soon. And he goes, okay, okay. Intentional self-care, just like Crystal yeah. said in the chat. I think we often put ourselves to the side when we're leaders, but we have to constantly be, um, you know, filling up like that cup, like everybody was saying. Now I see Patty's hands up. Patty, what would you like to ask? Hi, Jackie. Hi. Saw this flyer with you on it. And um, I'm just going to echo and repeat everything that Cindy said. I know you and I haven't known each other as long as some of these other folks in our room, but um, there is nothing more gratifying than watching leaders become more empowered in their leadership. So I just had to pop on and be here to, uh, to hear you and to hear what you have to say. And everything that everyone is contributing is such a wealth of information and good reminders. My, my question for you kind of piggybacks off of what Kim just asked you, but it's more in terms of that. You talk about your executive mindset, like, okay, here's my emotional self. And then I can do these things and kind of come back to this executive mindset. So I'm wondering what types of executive like logistical tools are helpful for you because you manage such a large sum of people and systems and you know a whole district like you said what kind of tools have been really useful to you like I mean just managing our email managing phone calls texts and then you know trying not to work 12 hours a day but you've always got something you could you could get to right or help you for the next day. So my question is more like those logistical tools that you have found helpful. Of course, um, for I think Google Drive has been life changing for us um, in our agency. That was part of when this COVID chaos happened. We all needed to go online, and I needed to have one place where we all had access to. And there were so many different platforms. You know, we have Dropbox and, you know, all these other workspaces. But um, for us, Google Drive worked because we're able, I'm able to create a calendar for our program. I'm able to share documents. Um, I can kind of share with you guys how I manage some of these things. Okay, so let me see. So there's my calendar and I have all of my people stuff there. Um, but then I created also a whole other drive. Um, so here, I'll show you guys this really quick. So this is my newsletter that goes out to my staff every week. And I use a PowerPoint just because I can keep adding on to it. Um, but this is our CC. So CC stands for Castake Early Childhood Education. Um, this is our newsletter, a weekly newsletter that goes out. So this week, this information went out. Um, acknowledged birthdays. I talked about Joy School is the English language learning um, program that we use. Curriculum, what are updates? Learning Genie is a platform that we use for our DRDPs, which is the developmental, um, the desired results developmental profile. So we use that. So different information, meeting information. Um, sometimes it looks very different. And we have like this one was huge. There's stuff about payroll on here. Um, I also oversee the special ed preschool program. So there's stuff about um, updates. So I use this to kind of keep them updated so I'm not bombarding their emails because then they, you know, then it came to the point where it, I was emailing them all the time and then they oversee it because they're like, oh, it's just another email. So at least they have this to go back to and all of these are linked so they can go directly to the the website or the document or whatever it may be. So I use that. Um, I also create a whole drive for every school year. So this, this one was la last year's. Um, and there's just different folders. And they have access to this as well. So they have access to all information about our meetings. Um, when we were doing distributions, all of the handouts for distribution by theme are on here. Um, so then they put them in the drive. I gave them a deadline. I went into the, the theme. I printed them out, had the packets, and they were ready to go. Um, so giving them access and, again, empowering them 
to do these things for themselves and not wait for me to say, okay, do it. We just kind of set up that system and using this as that platform has been so amazing for us. And now that all my staff can do it, even our instructional aides has been awesome as well. And it takes away a lot of the paperwork. It takes away a lot of the wait time. Um, for example, here you see our CC t-shirt order. We needed the t-shirt sizes. So I had all, I created this little spreadsheet. They all uploaded their sizes and then I was able to get that number. So technology is definitely a lifesaver. Definitely. And I think I was just telling my niece the other day that if anything ever happened to Google, I think I would not be able to survive. <laughs> oh my gosh. Don't even put that out in the universe. Right. Because that would be so awful. <laughs> so kind of my follow-up question, it kind of goes along with what Kim asked you. I'm also interested in how you talked about leaving notes when you do site visits and really calling out specific actions that you see and being authentic about that type of um, support and encouragement. How, how have you been able to really build those kinds of authentic relationships, like that kind of nitty gritty with your staff? Like, what are those mechanisms? Do you guys go to lunch? Do you make sure that you go to each site X amount of times a week? Like, you're so wide and spread out. How do you build that, like, practically, that community? In those relationships? Yeah, that is a really great question because it's exhausting. Um, the first, oh my gosh, I would say the first probably two years in my role as the leader at Castake was the most exhausting because I had to build all those relationships. And my goal every single year is to know the student's name by the first day of school. So there is no better way than to be out in the classrooms, than to meet families. I don't do any online registration at all. I don't do any of that. I meet them individually one at a time. So I think that is important, being visible. Um, right now, because of the restrictions still with COVID and everything, I visit, I focus on one school site a week. That way I'm not mixing, you know, the germs and cross contaminating if um, at all possible. Um, so right now I stick to one school site a week. If I'm pulled to sub because Lord knows we have no subs anywhere in the state of California, um, you know, then that's where I'm at for that week. So I do try to be at at least one school site for the week and I'll stop by if I'm not subbing, I'll stop by and observe. I'll stop by and I'll bring our curriculum puppets for some reading time, but I am there. Um, or sometimes I just go and I say, I'm here to help you. I'm giving you the gift of time. So what can I do for you? Do you want to step aside? Do you want to go get yourself a cup of coffee? Um, do you want to go answer emails? Do you want to go put in all of your observations? Whatever you want to do with your time and come back, fine. I'm here for this amount of time. So again, it's just being there for them and showing them that I'm willing to do those things as well. Um, as far as I going out to lunch and that kind of thing. I think there's a fine line as well between keeping your keeping that personal and keeping that professional leadership line um, because I am an entity in the community. Um, so sometimes, you know, my staff are in a very different point in their life. Sometimes they like to go out and, you know, have a drink and this, and I'm, there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, but I think there's a fine line that ha that can't be blurred as well. Um, we can have lunch in a, you know, at a school setting or whatever, but when it comes to doing things outside of work hours, I am very careful with what those things are um, because you also don't want misconstrued interpretations. Everyone's perspective is their reality. And I'm very conscious of that. Um, and that, and that can be dangerous and it can be helpful as well. Oh, I see a hand up, Maria. Hi, thank you very much for this great presentation. I'm um, from San Jose State. Um, and I, my question, I, I wonder, you've talked a lot and, and it's been great to learn about your interactions with staff. Do you work with principals pretty directly too? Because I'm really curious to know if you have any insights about how 
elementary principals are kind of seeing ECE within their kind of big picture vision for their schools and anything you might share about that aspect of leadership too would be great. Absolutely. That is one of my favorite questions. And yes, they have, I, I do work with principals as well. Um, Cass State is a very small district. There are only four schools total. Um, and then myself included, they see me as a school, um, just the admin of a school, which is preschool. So I do work with them. I am involved in all of the admin meetings, um, the admin decisions, that kind of thing for the most part. So I do work with them. When it comes to enrollment, I reach out to each principal. I go to their school site. This is what enrollment will look like. This is what we need this year, et cetera. Um, prior to me joining Castaic, I kid you not, some of them didn't even know that we had preschool on campuses. So it is a reality. It is a very true reality across many districts. People do not know that preschool exists or they say, oh, the, the kids, the, the babies, you know, the childcare. Um, and that's what it is. And I think being visible, being active in their schools, I attend PTA meetings. When the middle school has their um, back to school barbecue, guess who's grilling hot dogs? Um, you know, so it's being involved in those things. There, uh, We have an event coming up for gingerbread house making. So guess who's going to be putting together gingerbread houses? Um, because I want them to know that the work that we do is just as important and foundational as the work that they do. We start the work and they take off with it. So my personal um, mission statement is today's foundation for tomorrow's success. And that's what we do. We, feel, we build the foundations today. So we work with the principals to then let them take our babies from our classrooms. But it has taken that building of the relationship with them and them trusting me that what the work that we do is really valid. And I think it all came to light how much preschool and ECE programs do when the pandemic hit and oh, the hand washing and the cleaning and this and that. And the teachers are like, what? How can we even manage that? And my superintendent said, Jackie, can you open your classrooms for some of these teachers or can you talk to them and show them how they implement this? And that's what we did. So I think it takes building the relationship and being there for the back to school nights, joining their PTA, sending your staff to buy books from their book fair um, so that they know that they're a part of their school as well. One thing I want to note, too, is, um, you know, Jackie mentioned showing up to these different events. Jackie's at every single board meeting. And I think that she started doing that before she became part of the board meetings. Like she just showed up to the room and kept showing up, yeah. kept showing up. And now she's on the agenda every single month going, well, here's what's going on and let me share. And so that principal, she is now one of the administrators in the district. And before it used to be like preschools, like this separate hidden thing, yeah. she brought out to the forefront. She's like, everybody's going to know me where these are all of our students. Eventually they might not be elementary students now or your junior high, but they should be if they keep in the district. And we, you know, and so it's really been cool to see like you just keep showing up and eventually you're part of it. And Jackie, I think you're a great example of that because I don't think in the past, the leaders of the preschool programs were as involved in the board and had relationships with the board and administrators and no detriment to them because they're running everything, you know, I've no, nothing negative to them. But I think valuing that piece of it has put you in a different kind of place and category. I also think that, you know, many of us who are on right now are from colleges and higher education. Something you said that is so important, the start of our semesters, we are jam packed back to back to back to back to back to back meetings. We don't have any time to go out and just be around where our students are and go to these places where our students are. So one of my big, like, you know, kind of like my golden nugget from this moment right now is I'm going to change my scheduling at the start of the semester and not accept as many of my traditional meetings. So that way I just allot time for students the first couple days and just get out, you know, can I get to the bookstore? Can I get here more and more just to be that present? So I love that you said that, Jackie, because I think we get so wrapped up in all the training and meetings and responsibilities at the start of each semester that we forget about students are at the forefront always, no matter what their ages are. 
no matter if they're three years old in your program or they're you know a 65 reentry student in our program they're at the forefront of what we do always so um wonderful now what other questions do we have for jackie or i'm sorry maria did you have another part to your question i apologize okay Also, Maria, I love that you're coming from San Jose. Many met like in a whole nother life. I don't know if you happen to know who Bob Cooper is, <laughs> but Robert Cooper um, from your campus, huge impact, huge impact in my career. I'll look into that. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, Kathy, I see your hand up. Okay, hi, Jackie. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to this this meeting today, Renee. Um, I. I just want to give um, kudos to Jackie because how she presents herself on Zoom is how she really is in person. When I went and did site visits with her, um, first with her, and then she let me go on my own to the different preschool sites. And she really does check in with each teacher. Um, I don't, I can't say on a daily basis, but she knows every child in there. And there was one instance when I walked into a classroom, there was a child in a, in a class and he did not speak. Um, at first I waved to him and this is before we had to wear masks. So I, I'm, I'm a friendly kind of gal and he waved to me, but he did not have any words to say. And it was in a, a he ha had a, a, a diagnosed um, speech impairment, but Jackie started speaking to him in Spanish. And um, it, he just lit up because he knew that that was my friend Jackie. So she knows every single student in this classroom as well as every single student in all the other classrooms that I had. Um, I did visit all the classrooms, but she just is a dynamic leader. And I wish you the very best, Jackie. I hope that I, I get to yeah. see you again. I just wanted to say that, that you are really who you are. You are How you present here is really who you are. She All the things she's talking about is true. So I can vouch for her. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Kathy, I love that you just said that. I remember when Jackie was in my class, ooh, what, 15 years ago? I don't even know, Jackie, 12, 15 years ago. I remember going up to her and being like, okay, get ready, because you're going to be faculty and we're expecting you to be, I mean, Jackie, do you remember? I remember being like going up to you being like, okay, I know you're here right now, but this is the plan for the future. And like, <laughs> we've always had big plans from the moment you were in our lives. I, did. I totally remember. I remember. It's so awesome to see um, you've always been fantastic and now your fantasticness is getting out on a broader scale. That's what it's about. <laughs> oh, you guys, thank you so much. This, this has been so amazing. It really has my whole journey. Well, and your journey is an inspiration for a lot of our, a lot of people in California, you know what I mean? And so it's really important that the, the word gets out for sure. What other questions do we have for Jackie and her leadership style or anything re 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 revolving around her work and her occupation? Ooh, we have a, we have a question on the chat. What is your advice for people who are introverts but have the potential to be a leader? Ooh, that's a great one. Advice for introverts that have the potential to be a leader. That is awesome. And I actually have a staff member that is very, very much like that. Um, very quiet, but she is phenomenal. She has great ideas and um, amazing resources. So what I do is just start at her comfort level. And I created a folder in the drive. And I said, you know what, Miss Lacey, you have a folder in the drive to share some of these things um, with your colleagues. And then little by little, um, pull her into the conversations in during our meetings. And before you know it, she's been talking for 15, 20 minutes. So I just tell them to don't do more than what you're comfortable with. Don't let it be stressful. If it's stressful, then you tell me and I can take over. Um, but I really try to empower them with what I know about them and the limits that I know they have. And like my, my mentor did with me previous, give her that little extra push to be able to show herself that she can do it. So it's like you create the space and you give a push. Correct. But not like a big push, just a no. little push. Just a little poke, just enough. Very high God scan, right? Yes, very. Out. Just go to that next level. Excellent. Exactly. I see Crystal's hands up. Crystal, why don't you uh, go ahead and unmute and share with us? 
So I just wanted to say, Jackie, from an educator perspective and a person that is all for empowering, encouraging just children and culture, thank you for being an icon at what you do and mastering the skills of social emotional development, not just for our children, but for our colleagues and staff and for the field to see that it's okay to be yourself mm -hmm. and making that transparency for your staff to know that we're human. I just want to say thank you for just giving me tools to keep empowering and to take back to my facility and to join the team and utilizing like a book study and just different interventions to keep that love and empowerment alive. So thank you and keep up your great work. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you so much for your words and your comments. Um, I did put my email, <clears throat> my work email in the chat. That is right now what I have most access to. So feel free if you have questions. Um, I typically respond within 24 to 48 hours. I will be checking my spam because I know sometimes different emails go there. So um, there's my email if you guys have any other questions or Appreciate if you want to me. Excellent. Wonderful, Jackie. Thank you so much for being such a resource. Now, I know we're getting close on time here, but before we wrap, is there anybody else who has a question or comment that they'd like to share? I do see in the chat that Leah wrote, I love that you take the time to pay attention to each individual's needs, uh, which is so important. But before I have we... a question. Oh, yes, Kim. Jackie. What's mm -hmm. next? <laughs> What's next? How did you know there was a next? Because there's it, yeah. always a next and there has to be because incredible leaders never stop growing. So I can't oh, wait to see you. what's next. So I actually, I just finished my master's in August um, and I told myself I will never go back to school and do my PhD, never, never, never. But I am craving that structured learning. I am craving it like you wouldn't believe. So I don't know that I'm ready to do my PhD next, but what I am really diving into is I'm working on becoming a master teacher for conscious discipline. So it is, you guys, intense. It is about a 10-year process to really, really become a master at implementing conscious discipline. So I'm starting my journey and I am so excited because my ultimate goal when I retire, I know it's so far away. Well, not really, but once I retire, that can be my retirement fun because it's really another passion. I'd still be connecting with people. So um, my next is definitely that conscious discipline. Um, and I now have a tickle to teach at the college level. So I will be reaching out to Cindy Stevens. I have a passion to teach and I think having the experience in the classroom and as a leader, I can, um, I feel like I'm equipped to share that with other students. Fantastic. I love it. I love it. I love it. I've been waiting for that day that you're going to be faculty. <laughs> Me too. I am thrilled. I am so excited. Well, and it's a good in between time. So those of us who are on that are higher ed, you know, maybe Jackie would be available to um, come and be a speaker or to come and do a training or, you know, just start thinking that way. Because this is part of what we do is finding good leaders and elevating. Right, everybody. That is part of this. And Jackie, you're at least 10 years younger than me. And so I know you've, and I know I've got at least another 15, 20 years. And so we want to make sure that this next generation keeps, uh, keeps going and uh, keeps elevating. So wonderful, wonderful day here today. Any final questions or comments before we wrap up? We're a few minutes early, which doesn't happen, but that's an okay thing. Okay, I don't see any final questions, but thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Let's give Jackie a huge praise for being here today, Jackie. We love you. We learned so much from you today. It was beautiful to have an early childhood leadership perspective. Um, our, our national, we're going to see early childhood go into a whole different stratosphere with our national kind of investments that are coming. And so um, Jackie can't wait to see what happens next and looking forward to continue collaborating, working with you. So everybody, thank you for a beautiful day. Um, Jackie, thank you so much for being here. And we hope everyone has a fantastic weekend.
Yes, thank you so much for having me and please reach out with any questions. And if somebody didn't grab Jackie's email or contact information, please just shoot me a message. Um, Renee Marshall, um, I'm the one who sends out all the emails um, and I'm happy to connect. So thank you everybody for being here today and have a wonderful weekend, everyone.